All right, thank you very much. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, I thank you all very, very much for finding the actual room. I wasn't sure if I would actually be able to after we got swapped. I think it's kind of an interesting metaphor for Python in general that data science is pushing all the rest of us out, uh, but that's okay. Uh, all right, so this talk is going to be about best practices for performing cryptography in Python. Uh, and I'd like to start out with something a little bit unusual, which is spoiling the conclusion. Which, of course, I have to push the right buttons, but that's all right. There we go. Yes, secure cryptography is possible in Python. But as with anything related to cryptography, there are asterisks. How many depends on what you're trying to do. This is a lousy answer, uh, but since most of this room likely fights with computers for a living, you should be used to disappointment. Uh, now that you've seen the conclusion, you're all welcome to leave, of course. It's quite warm. Uh, but if you'd like to know why this is true, stick around. Hi, I'm Paul Kerr. Uh, I'm a principal security engineer at a, a company called Trail of Bits and a core developer for the Python Cryptographic Authority. I spend my days reading papers, auditing low-level cryptographic implementations, writing Python cryptographic code, and other really, really boring things. Uh, for those of you in the back who can't easily see me, I provided a recent selfie on this slide as well. <laughs> so we have an agenda today. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, and this is a very complex topic. At the end of this talk, you should have a reasonable understanding of what I mean when I say, is Python good for cryptography? Knowing the limitations and strengths of this language in the context of security sensitive software will let you make more informed decisions when designing and building your projects in the future. This talk assumes no background knowledge about cryptography or the implementation details of the Python interpreter, unlike the draft I had of this at 8 a.m. Uh, it does, however, provide an introduction to those cryptographic concerns and tries to provide a grounding to users without cryptographic or C language experience. Uh, if you have no C language experience, I'm jealous of you, uh, and I would love to meet you. Uh, <laughs> once we've completed that introduction, we'll run through a thought exercise around implementing some cryptography in pure Python, briefly talk about risk assessment and threat modeling uh, for your application, discuss the not-so-secret superpower that Python has, and draw some conclusions, which you've already seen, but pretend we haven't. So what is cryptography, really? Well, in the pres presence of adversaries, we need to be able to securely communicate information. Uh, adversaries can be passive or active, which is to say, in a passive context, they're just listening. Uh, they can also be active, which is to say they sit in the middle and they want to manipulate things. Maybe they are trying to terminate connections. Maybe they're attempting to just flip bytes and, and, and screw with things you're attempting to do. Communication may be synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, synchronous communication in this context is something like TLS, say HTTPS, of that, uh, things of that nature. Or in an asynchronous model, you may be looking at things like Signal or WhatsApp, where you're, where you're uh, attempting to communicate securely and you're not actually talking to the other side at the exact same time. Information is not necessarily a file. A lot of people tend to think of everything in a file-based model, but actually all the information around your communication channel is also something you want to protect. In an ideal world, we'd like to protect the fact that you're even talking to somebody. Uh, it turns out in the way we've designed the internet, that's not possible right now, but we would very much like to hide every bit of metadata we possibly can. In practice, writing cryptographic software is difficult because you need both algorithms and implementations to be secure. Uh, so a few more common forms of cryptography, just for those of you who may be wondering. Uh, you have symmetric encryption, uh, you have asymmetric signatures. Symmetric encryption is things like AES. Asymmetric signatures are things like ECDSA, RSA. Don't worry about these acronyms. I'm just going to throw acronym soup at you all day long. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but then uh, there's also more esoteric things that are kind of more interesting in the f uh, fields of cryptography these days, like zero-knowledge provers, uh, oblivious RAM, and things of that nature. Um, ultimately, in cryptography, any information leakage can be problematic. An attacker may be able to reconstruct things that are meant to be secret based on information as seemingly mundane as how long it took to process the message. If we assume that the abstract algorithm itself doesn't leak information, then what's left is ensuring the concrete implementation is safe. Thus, implementing cryptographic algorithms is essentially an exercise in eliminating information leakage. So now that we have a workable definition for cryptography, we need to define the scope. We're going to focus strictly on implementation-based issues caused by language level restrictions. This is an important caveat. 
Like, we don't get to dive into the wild world of protocol or algorithmic flaws which transcend the language you choose. They're not relevant to the problems of Python. They're a problem of the entire cryptographic ecosystem. They're an incredibly cool aspect of cryptography the discipline, and I would happily talk your ear about those, uh, your ear off about those for days. Uh, but that's a different talk. So you want to implement a cryptographic algorithm. What are we going to need? Well, we need low-level flow control, uh, which will allow us to prevent data-dependent branching. Um, that's kind of a fancy way of just saying that we want to make sure that we control the way that the processor actually executes everything we do. Uh, we don't want to have anything in the middle that we can avoid. We want to be able to control the caches. That's, you know, in, in a modern processor, you have level one, level two, and level three caches. Uh, level one caches actually have both a data cache and an instruction cache. Those things are all relevant. Uh, it turns out we even care about things like cache lines, which is the number of bytes read and written to caches on, at specific levels. Uh, because if we don't, if, we, if our data strides across cache lines, then that may introduce timing variability that we care about. We need to have price, precise memory allocation and erasure. We need to be able to control when we zero it. We need to be able to control whether or not it ever gets swapped to disk. We need to be able to do effectively anything we like, possibly can imagine to it. We need as much speed as we can possibly get. Uh, you will never, ever hear anyone in cryptography say, that was fast enough. We can stop. Um, cryptography is always considered overhead. And to make sure that people use it and to make sure that we can use it everywhere, it needs to have the absolute lowest overhead possible. Uh, in practice, this means that we want to be able to do things like an AES process multiple gigabytes per second per core. Uh, or in TLS, uh, Netflix has historically actually resisted using TLS for delivery of things because of the 1% CPU overhead that it provides. Uh, so and as you might imagine, when you're talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of CPU cores, 1% actually ends up being a decent amount of money. So we want processors well, we want processors to be faster, of course, but it turns out that since 2006, we don't get that. So now we need to figure out how to make cryptography faster. Uh, and then, of course, you need an aversion to healthy life choices whenever you're doing anything in cryptography. Not a requirement, but I do highly recommend it. <laughs> so, unfortunately, this means most of this code is written in C. Why? Well, ultimately, ubiquity. C, uh, the C ABI is the lingua franca of computing. Uh, if you don't know what an ABI is, don't worry about it. Uh, in C, you compile code into a binary, and within the binary, data is structured in a very specific fashion to allow the lookup and calling of functions. Uh, the manner in which this is done is called the application binary interface, or ABI. Many lo uh, languages know how to invoke things via the C ABI, and that can be a very powerful tool to augment their own capabilities. Python's included, but let's again, let's pretend I haven't said that just yet. We don't want to ruin my amazing reveals. Second, cryptography cares deeply about speed, as we've already talked about, and C is much faster than Python, uh, and many other languages, for reasons outside the scope of this talk. For now, just know that you can do all sorts of things, frequently very, very dangerous ones, that can make things faster. And of course, the memory unsafety industrial complex requires CVEs to run. If we stop writing things in memory unsafe languages, we'd eliminate around 75% of all security vulnerabilities, and why would we ever want to do that? So let's go into an illustrative example. Let's talk about implementing an asymmetric algorithm. The most commonly used algorithm here is RSA, even though it really shouldn't be. For budding crypto uh, cryptographic engineers, it is popular since it's so easy to implement, and your massive mistakes in doing so make for a great horror story once you have more experience. I won't go into all the ways in which this algorithm is dangerous right now, but I've got some references at the end for those of you who are interested. Uh, they go into far too much depth and have a lot of profanity, so they're not safe for this conversation. Uh, RSA allows both signing and encryption, so I put the relev relevant equations on this slide. Uh, cryptographers are lazy, like mathematicians, uh, so we use non-descriptive variable names, but I'll try to give both the name and the variable every time I talk about components of these equations in this talk. So for signing, you take a message, you raise it to the private expo exponent, that's m to the d, where d is the private exponent, and you do that modulo n, uh, which is called, conveniently, the modulus. Uh, the modulus is a product of two primes, p and q, which we'll talk about a little bit later. To verify a message, you take the signature, that's s, you raise it to the power of e, which is, of course, the public exponent, of course, right? Uh, 
And that public exponent is uh, selected in a way we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, for the abstract algorithm, all of these operations are performed as integers. So when you look at this, you can actually think of this in, in terms of exactly the classical mathematics that you're used to. You convert your message to an integer, and then you receive an integer signature. Of course, since everything in computing is really just bits, we can, of course, represent an integer as bytes, which is how you typically see signatures and messages shown within cryptographic APIs. Uh, and in fact, if you read cryptographic papers, commonly you will see mathematics that look very similar to this. Uh, you can actually think of that almost always as integers being operated upon. Uh, it just so happens that as an implementation detail, we can operate the, on these things as opaque bytes, byte strings in very weird ways. Uh, so one interesting consequence of these equations is that a message has a maximum length related to the size of the key, and the signing operation requires the private key, while the rarefication only requires the public key. Uh, the private key in this particular case you can think of as D, and the public key is actually just N and E together. Uh, this, of course, is what the essence of what makes this an asymmetric algorithm, right? You can perform certain operations with only the public components and certain operations only with the private. Whoops. No. <laughs> so for an RSA encryption, as opposed to a signature, you encrypt using the public key and decrypt using the private key. That is m to the e, that's message to the, expo uh, to the public exponent modulo n, gives you the original message, or sorry, gives you the ciphertext, and c to the d modulo n uh, gives you the original message. This allows anyone with your public key to encrypt things that only you can decrypt. This is actually commonly used in older versions of TLS. Uh, so like when you initially do a handshake, it, was, it used to be the case that you would take the public key from the certificate, encrypt what was called a pre-master secret, send it back to the server, and then the server would then decrypt that, perform a small operation that both sides knew how to do, and then you would have a master secret that you could use to communicate. Um, that has its own set of problems, primarily the fact that it's not what's called forward secret, uh, which is to say that if someone captures that public uh, captures the uh, public key and is able to derive what that private key would be at some point in the future, be it 10 or 20 years from now, every single bit, bit of traffic that was ever captured underneath that will be decryptable. Uh, you can avoid that with some other properties that again goes out of the, uh, out of the uh, subject of this talk. Okay, so enough math. How do we generate the keys we need to perform these equations? An RSA key is ultimately created from just three values, uh, two of which we need uh, we need to actually create. First, we pick a public exponent, which, as we remember before, is called E. Uh, this value should always be 65,537 for hilarious reasons related to coprimality, computational efficiency, and resistance to a very specific kind of attack. Sometimes people pick 3 or 17, or in one memorable instance, 1. Uh, <laughs> but picking anything that isn't 65,537 is going to make me squint very hard at you. Incidentally, if you're curious why 1 is a bad choice, I, I, I kind of hit spacebar and it goes too forward. That's the, that's the power of Google Docs. Uh, so let's cl look closely at that equation here again. What happens if E is 1? M to the E. Uh, that's right, nothing. Uh, in this case, C would then become the same as M. And even though the algorithm was run, the, all the, the entire cryptographic operation was performed, the value does not change. Uh, oops. Back to the topic at hand. What else do we need to know when generating an RSA key? Well, we know our public, expo uh, public exponent will be 65,537 on pain of catapult. But we also need to prevent, uh, create two primes, the P and Q. They must be very large primes, uh, typically around 2048 bit right now. Uh, and generating them involves having both a cryptographically, uh, cryptographically secure pseudorandom number generator, CSPRNG, and a probabilistic primality tester. Oh, but make sure you run enough iterations, because it turns out that in an adversarial model, you can, can pick, you can pick composite numbers. That's a number that's not prime. That can fool primality testing with insufficient iteration. I know, I know. I promise to keep the scope of, uh, to implementation level problems, but cryptography has so many delightful places you can fail without even knowing it. So from P and Q and E, you derive a host of values, like the modulus n, which is P times Q is all. The private exponent, d, which is the modular multiplicative inverse, but again, that's not a big deal in this particular case, and various CRT coefficients. CRT is the Chinese remainder theorem, which provides means to highly accelerate the operations in RSA. 
They're not required, but there's the sort of thing that any serious RSA implementation will actually have. And it turns out that they themselves are, uh, are vulnerable to all sorts of things like fault attacks that allow partial prim uh, private key recovery and all sorts of other terrible things. Uh, so all those things are just in details. Incredibly important, finicky details that you will get wrong. And maybe I shouldn't have chosen RSA, the wor worst widely used crypto system in existence. Uh, we didn't even talk about how I can't use RSA without special padding because it will kill everyone you've ever loved. Uh, anywho, to implement these equations in Python, we really only need two things, big integers and modular exponentiation. Big integers because these are really big numbers. So we need our math library to let us make them that big without losing precision. Uh, in fact, if you look at these equations, as I said previously, you'll see that you can just convert everything into an integer value and you'll be fine. Modular exponentiation is maybe a little bit less obvious. But if you look at the number above, and imagine that being exponentiated, your intuition likely suggests that this might be a performance problem. Uh, what do you suppose the number here to the 65,537th power might be? Uh, suffice it to say that modular exponentiation makes it possible to make enormous numbers like this uh, be exponentiated without the problem becoming computationally intractable. I would like it noted that I resisted the error to explain how to implement constant time modular exponentiation with Montgomery ladder here, but never fear, I put a link in the references at the end. Okay, so we've finally gotten to some actual Python. Here's what Lex looks like when you implement this in Python. Python supports arbitrarily large integers, so we're covered there, and the built-in pow function supports modular exponentiation. Job done. Um, although it looks like we still have a little bit of time to left in this talk slot, so uh, I guess I'll elaborate a bit. The problem here, and the problem in general with this sort of approach, is that you need to avoid side channel information leakage. Remember how I said implementations require you to uh, minimize the sort of information that anyone can get about the data that's in there? Well, when performing modular ex exponentiation on large values, you can leak information about those values via this timing variability. Uh, cryptographic libraries in an ideal world, and we do not live in an ideal world, so let's just all take that for what it's worth, carefully build their mathematical operations to be constant time. Uh, this means that different data inputs, given the same length input, do not take varying amounts of time to process. This is both difficult to do and not ideal for non-cryptographic applications. After all, normally you want something as to, to complete as fast as possible, right? You don't want it to take longer all the time just because a few potential operations might be slower than others. Since Python is meant for far more than just cryptography, it's mod, exp, uh, it's mod exp, uh, that's just the short way of saying modular exponentiation, is not written to be constant time. And so unfortunately, our elegant RSA implementation here using POW is vulnerable to timing attacks. OK, so we can't use POW. This road surely leads somewhere good, so let's write it ourselves. Uh, are we going to use Python's integers? Why not? They support arbitrarily large values, which is good, since for RSA, we want these giant numbers. Huh, what's that sign? Um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, unfortunately, we can't reasonably access the underlying representation of the big integers in, in Python, right? Python has an underlying mathematical representation of what those big, big integers are. Uh, it is some allocation of memory that allows you to do things within that context. But we can't access that data from the Python side. So we're going to have to implement our own, if we want to implement our own modular exponentiation, we'll need to write our own big int as well. This may be doable, although anything you write is executing in the Python interpreter, so you'll have to be careful to avoid all the various ways Python may helpfully make your apparently branch-free code branchy or data dependent. Um, at this point, we've strayed pretty far from things Python gives us, uh, but no matter. What a cute dog. That's probably not a metaphor for the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, assuming you manage to build a Python-based big int and modular exponentiation system, you may now think your problems are solved. Except, what about the way Python allocates memory? You can't use byte strings because they're immutable, except, of course, secretly as a performance optimization. Sometimes they're not in CPython. Uh, additionally, Python allocates memory in large blocks from, uh, that it gets from the operating system. The, uh, this is called slab allocation. And then it hands those pieces out to Python objects as needed. Uh, this is normally fine, and in fact, it can be a performance optimization in certain cases, but it means it's extremely difficult to control where copies of sensitive data may reside in memory. Just because you let a variable go out of scope doesn't mean that memory has been zeroed. In fact, Python does not zero memory by default. It just throws it back into the slab, and then you can just get another allocation later. 
And Python provides no tools for preventing parts of memory from being written to swap. Uh, in C, you would use a tool called mlock to prevent this. Now, some of this is a little bit esoteric at this point because a lot of the time you end up with uh, encrypted swap partitions and other things. Uh, but we're talking strictly in the, in the realm of what this language gives us to prevent us from shooting ourselves in the foot. So, so let's now hand wave away everything we've talked about. We've solved it. This all works in Python. Is it production ready now? Well, <laughs> still no. Uh, the implementation you've just built is going to be extraordinarily slow. Orders of magnitude, perhaps five or six orders of magnitude faster than the fastest implementations that exist. <sighs> Dope. Uh, all right, so this set of problems exists for most cryptographic prim primitives if you try and implement them in pure Python. It is not strictly an RSA problem. Uh, in fact, some things are even worse since Python has no native way to take advantage of, of SIMD or hardware accelerated instruction sets like ASNI, PCLMO QTQ, and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, but is this really an issue? Let's ask a scientist. So, Professor, would you say uh, it's time for everyone to panic? Yes, I would, Kent. So, insert your existential screens here. Or, instead of panicking, we could figure out which of these threats matters for your use case. We've talked a great deal about how Python is bad at protecting against various forms of information leakage in that example. This may, you, uh, this may make you wonder why this fool of a speaker started the talk by explaining that he works on multiple Python cryptographic libraries. Uh, it's a fair criticism, but we'll get there shortly. Uh, first of all, when you're establishing what matters, threat modeling your application can tell you what you should consider in scope as a threat. Uh, there's a talk today at 4 p.m. in this room about threat modeling the Death Star. So if you're not familiar with threat modeling, you should definitely stick around for that. There's a variety of methods that people use, and uh, there's a specific one that they're going to go through in the, that talk. Uh, I highly recommend knowing something about how threat modeling works. It can be very dry, but it's also just absurdly valuable for understanding the security of your application. So in a highly simplified form, your threat model may determine that the particular use case that you have, uh, asymmetric encryption, does not need side channel protection. And thus, a pure Python solution may actually make sense. Uh, similarly, it's possible that both performance and side channel concerns don't matter if you're implementing something like an offline signing system. I would love to give specific advice here for all possible uh, scenarios, but cryptography is a nuanced discipline, and what's secure in one situation may be catastrophically broken in another. However, when in doubt, err on the side of using Python's most powerful feature, calling the C ABI. All right. So Python has a rich FFI to languages that speak the C ABI, C -ABI uh, through CFFI, C types, and a few other tools uh, that allow Python code to leverage this kind of native code. This bridge gives access to every feature needed for safe cryptography, uh, as well as allowing the construction of Pythonic APIs on top of difficult to use cryptographic libraries. There is almost no chance that you are not constantly using C when you're writing Python. Uh, be that data science, be that cryptography, uh, in general, that is a very, very common thing to see inside the context of Python. Uh, it's also the way that people end up trying to make it go fast when they need things to be faster. Uh, so almost every serious Python cryptographic library is built in this fashion. Uh, the SSL module and standard library uses OpenSSL. Cryptography itself uses cryptography, the library, not the discipline. I apologize. We named it poorly. Uh, it uses OpenSSL via CFFI. Uh, Pinnacle uses LibSodium via CFFI. Bcrypt uses... Uh, code that's extracted from OpenBSD, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, pure Python cryptographic libraries do exist, but their use is typically predicated on deployment environments where compiled modules are difficult to use. Uh, this is partially an artifact of Python's spotty history with pre-compiled binaries. In the past several years, the situation has gotten much better with wheels, but some challenges still remain. Uh, you can check out Alana Hashman's talk, uh, The Black Bath Magic of Python Wheels, which was given at PyCon US this year, or my own much more out-of-date, reliably distributing binary modules, which was uh, given in 2016, uh, for more information about these challenges. Uh, for this reason, while FFI-based cryptography is the best answer, in rare cases it may not be practical depending upon your specific deployment needs. FFI-based cryptography has one other significant disadvantage that I would be remiss if I didn't point out. Since these libraries are typically written in C, the potential for memory and safety exists within them. Uh, it is possible to use FFI with, with other languages such as Rust, which allows you to compile to a C ABI. Uh, but unfortunately, the tool chains and libraries available are not as widely available and is not, the, the, basically the, the community knowledge isn't quite there yet, so most of the time we're still stuck with C. Uh, 
in general, the risk of this sort of behavior is significantly mitigated because you're not directly interacting with that library. Instead, the Python library you've chosen uh, is wrapping the things around, uh, wrapping all its magic around it, right? So you've got, they've, that library's gonna be responsible for allocating the buffers, initializing the data structures, et cetera. Uh, but sometimes programmers, even cryptographic engineers, perhaps especially cryptographic engineers, make mistakes. The reality of low-level Python cryptographic library development is that we essentially write C in Python and try to wrap the most Pythonic APIs that we can so that on top you, uh, wrap, the, wrap the most Pythonic APIs we can on top so that you, the user, don't have to know what terrible things that lurk beneath the service. So finally, a quick word on memory. If your threat model encompasses memory disclosure, then one of the most common goals is to minimize the time a particular secret is resident in memory. In Python, this means you can't use byte strings. That's really what it means, uh, which is unfortunate because there's no way to control the zeroing. Uh, instead, you're going to be forced to use byte arrays or other mutable objects that support the buffer protocol. If you find yourself in this situation, I highly recommend writing a context manager to auto-zero the byte arrays when you're done with it. Uh, cryptography supports passing of these types of buffers in almost every API, and I think that might be the only truly actionable advice I've given you, so hooray. Oh, hey, we've seen this slide before. So secure cryptography is possible in Python. It does frequently mean that Python is what you use to call some underlying native code, not that the crypto cryptographic code itself is in Python. And threat models are critical. When you're building secure software, you're always choosing trade-offs. So you need to carefully consider what you do and do not consider to be worth protecting against. You cannot do everything, not with unlimited money and certainly not with the amount of money that normal people have. Uh, so here are the references I promised you. Uh, there's a variety of things that, are, that run the gamut from uh, profanity-laden rants about RSA uh, to the actual first paper that talked about what a constant time Montgomery ladder would be, which is a squaring, uh, an exponential squaring method. Uh, there's, a, there's a set of people who I work with who complain about memory unsafety on Twitter that I would love for you to follow, and information about uh, Python wheels. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, although I will take this quick opportunity to remind people that questions have an upward inflection at the end and require a response from me. If you don't have those two things, it's probably an angry tweet you should direct at that Twitter handle. Thank you very much. Enjoy thank your you. mug. Thank you. So do we have any questions? We can probably fit in maybe two or three. Or are they all too hard and no one wants to ask them? Nothing at all? All right, then. Oh, oh, wait till the last minute. You said don't use RSA, so what should we use instead? So it depends upon your specific use case, but in general, the answer would be uh, if you can and you don't have weird US government restrictions, you should be using like uh, Twisted Edwards 25519, ED25519 for signatures, and for encryption, you should be using a, a, con a construction called ECIES, which is elliptic curve integrated encryption systems. Uh, so that's. Those both have less probability of screwing up, although not zero. Uh, but the, I, the general trajectory of cryptographic algorithms uh, in this world right now is we try and build algorithms themselves that are harder to misimplement, and then we try and build APIs that are harder to misuse. Uh, and so we're getting there slowly, but RSA represents the state of the art of the 1970s. <laughs> Any last question before we all go? Uh, do you ever consider quantum computing when you're building, like, for future security? Uh, so I hate always saying it depends on your threat model. Uh, yes, sometimes you do have to care about that now. Uh, so it becomes a question of whether or not you care about nation state actors, and it becomes a question about how long you care about your data remaining secure. Uh, so, like, in the case, like, if you imagine a hypothetical case where you have a, somebody who very deeply cares about it, having something remain secure for communication for the next 50 years because they're dropping a buoy at the bottom of the ocean, um, then they may get very much care about being able to do uh, what we know as post-quantum secure algorithms. Uh, most efficient post-quantum secure algorithms are currently very inefficient space-wise. 
Uh, so basically, if we, if we have a belief in their security, then they kind of suck to use. Uh, and so but there's, most of the research right now is around trying to make them much more efficient so that you can have them in a single round trip of a TCP connection or things of that nature. Uh, if you don't have those restrictions, then they're actually decent uh, things that are usually hash-based that you can use right now. So there are two more that I'm going to squeeze in, and then we all have to go so Sarah can set up. Uh, you mentioned Rust not being ready yet. Uh, is that a lack of crypto libraries on the Rust side or issues with the bindings into Python? Uh, so Rust itself, I would say, is actually very much ready as a language. It's the world that is, needs to catch up. Uh, so the being able to invoke Rust from Python, not a problem, although distutil setup tools don't give you Rust C stuff for free the way that you get that on, uh, from GCC Clang. Uh, and so that's a little bit of the, of the issue. The other part of the issue is, yes, that the, like, we have cryptographic libraries we've been building for 25 years that even though they have terrible APIs, have a lot of um, battle testing around them. And, they, and there's things that we're actually willing to trust, at least the base level cryptographic algorithms we trust. And on the Rust side, there's not a lot of that just yet. Uh, it's getting there very rapidly. Uh, but you also have to overcome the entrenched opposition of what appear to be millions of programmers who think that if you just think really hard, you can write C well. <laughs> so it turns out the last question was the same question. So um, thank you again to Paul. And we're going to set Sarah up next.